In this video, we're going to explore set relationships. So again, there's going to be just a lot of uh, terminology here, a lot of definitions, um, but do your best to kind of understand the basics so that as we move through the rest of this unit talking about sets, that um, you don't get lost in the notation. So here we're talking about set equality and sets are equal if and only if they have the same elements. So first notice the way that this is notated. I'm saying for all X, X is, a cell, X is an element of A if and only if X is an element of B. And we would just write that A equals B. So let's say I have set A is 0, 1, 1, 3, 4, Four. and set B is 0, 1, 3, 4. These are equal sets. So I can say here that set A is equal to set B because even though I have a duplicate of 1 and a duplicate of 4, there are no elements that are in one set that are not in the other set. And again, it doesn't matter the order, it doesn't matter if there are duplicates. However, if B included five, now all of a sudden A is not equal to B. So those sets would no longer be equal because B has a, a value or an element of five that is not contained in set A. Now let's talk about a subset. A subset or a set A is a subset of B if and only if every element of A is also an element of B. So let's take a look at a Venn diagram before we look at the notation that we might use. If I have a Venn diagram, a subset might look like this. So we've got some universe out here and this would be set A and this would be set B. So essentially what I'm saying is anything in set A is also contained in set B. So let's say A is the set of elements 1, 2, 3, and B is the set of elements 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So if I were putting these values on, on my Venn, 1, 2, and 3 would all be in set A, four and five would be in set B, but notice that everything in set A is also contained in set B. So this would be a subset. Again, this is the notation that we would use. We're saying for all X's, if X is an element in A, then X is an element in B. And then this is the notation that we will use. So I want you to kind of think about this as like a less than or equal to B essentially saying everything in A is in B and maybe they're exactly the same, but maybe they're not. So a little bit more on subsets. If I'm going to show that A is a subset of B, essentially I have to show that every element of A belongs to B. Oops, belongs to B. That was a horrible B. Every element of A belongs to B. So I'm saying if X belongs to A, then X belongs to B. Now, why is it important to know this? Because obviously there will be some proof involved and this is the way that we will go about that proof is to show that if it belongs to A, then it belongs to B as well. Obviously, if I wanna show that A is not a subset of B, all I have to do is find some example um, that shows that it's not true, essentially. So I'm going to find an element. If there exists some element X um, that belongs to A that does not belong to B, essentially is what I want to do. So show it belongs to A. belongs to set A, but not set B. 
And the last one says show A is a subset of B and B is a subset of A. Now why would this be important? Because if this is true, thinking about it this way, A is less than or equal to B, B is less than or equal to A, if both of those are true, what could we state? We could state that A is equal to B. So that's essentially what we're going to do and this one's super important because this is how you will prove that A is equal to B is to show that both of those statements are true. So you're proving that the subset of A, or that A is a subset of B, that B is a subset of A, and therefore A and B are equal sets. So now that we understand a subset, it's important to understand the difference between a subset and a proper subset. So with our subsets, we said A was a subset of B, and we used this line to denote that they could in fact be the exact same set. So here we're talking about a proper subset and note how my notation is just going to change a little bit. A proper subset says that A is a subset of B but that they are not equal to one another. Therefore, we have some element in B that's not contained in A. So let's say A was that set of one, two, three. If B was the set of one, two, three, I could say A is a subset of B and B is a subset of A and therefore A and B are equal sets. However, if B is now one, two, three, four, A is still a subset of B but B is not a subset of A, these are not equal, and therefore A is a proper subset of B, and it's proper because we've got this one little guy in set B that is not contained in A. And again, here is the longer version using our, our predicate logic. For all X's, if X belongs to A, then X belongs to B, and there exists some element that belongs to B, and that does not belong to A. So that is a proper subset. So now we want to talk about cardinality. And cardinality is just essentially the size of your set. So cardinality is the number of distinct elements of a set, and of course distinct being important here. Let's say set A is one, two, three, 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 four, then the cardinality of A, and notice that notation is just using essentially like the absolute value bracket on each side. This is saying how many distinct elements are there? There's one, two, three, four distinct elements. So three, 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 there's three of them, so those aren't all distinct, but you get the idea. Um, so the notation, again, is just, that's what tells me that I'm finding the cardinality or the number of elements in the set. So let's say I wanted to find the number of elements in the set of the alphabet. Oops, maybe try to spell alphabet correctly. Well, there are 26 letters of the alphabet, and so that would be the cardinality of that set. The cardinality of the empty set Hopefully we all know that zero because the empty set is saying that there is nothing in the set. Now I want to introduce you to a couple of concepts that really this is just an introduction, but as we move forward through this course, we will use these concepts again and again. So the first of those is the power set. And the power set is the set of all subsets of a set. So for instance, let's say set A is 0, 1, 2. If I want the power set of A, then I want all of the subsets. So the subset would be the empty set, because again, I'm looking at these elements. I could have none of those elements. I could have one of those elements, so 0, 1, 2, I could have two of those elements, 0, 1, 0, 2, 
or 1, 2. Or I could have three of those elements, 0, 1, 2. Now keep in mind, because order doesn't matter, I wouldn't have to write 0, 1, and 1, 0 because those are the same set. So how many um, elements does the power set have? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So the cardinality of the power set of A is 8. And again, we'll talk more in depth about this later, but if you ever want the cardinality of the power set of a set of a set, whoa, getting crazy, of a set with n elements is 2 to the n. So here I had three elements and therefore 2 to the third was 8, and that is exactly how many we found. So this brings us to tuples, and a tuple is important because basically it's an ordered collection that has a sub 1 as its first element, a sub 2 as its second element, etc., etc. Um, obviously the way that we would have seen this most often is in ordered pairs. So a comma so a1 comma a2, you get the idea. It's basically just two values, but the important thing here is that it's ordered, whereas when we're just looking at a normal set, we don't worry about the order, but ordered pairs, obviously the ordered pair of 5, 2 is not the same as the ordered pair of 2, 5. Those are very different points on our Cartesian plane. So I bring up ordered tuples because of the Cartesian product, which we will talk much more about when we talk about relations further along in this course. But it's essentially the set of ordered pairs, A comma B, where A, each element A belongs to the set A and each element B belongs to the set B, resulting from A times B. So let's say set A is zero and one and set B is 2, 3, 4. What a Cartesian product tells us to do is it's going to be all of the ordered pairs that I can create using one element of A and one element of B. So I could have 0, 2. I could have 0, 3. 0, 4. Or I could have 1 comma 2, 1 comma 3, 1 comma 4. So again, each time I used a value from set A and an element from set B, and I've done all of the different combinations. Um, again, I said later on we'll talk about relations, but let's say I had a subset R that included just 0, 2, and 1, 2. This would be considered a relation because it is a subset of that Cartesian product. Lastly, let's take a look at what is called a truth set. A truth set of P is the set of elements X in the domain such that P of X is true. So obviously this is some sort of propositional function and we're saying the truth set is any values that make P of X true. So our notation says X is an element of D, D is obviously the domain, such that P of X is true. So let's say the domain here is the integers and let's say P of X represents the statement that the absolute value of x is equal to 3. Well, if that's the case, then the truth set would be the set of all values that I could put in here to make it true. So what values of x would make the absolute value of x equals 3 true? And of course, that would be negative 3 and positive 3. So that would be the truth set because I'm looking for any values that I can plug in for x and get a true value. So the absolute value of negative 3 is 3, and the absolute value of positive 3 is 3. 
Coming up next, we're going to take a look at operations on sets.